Uh, we are continuing in our series in Acts. We've been calling this series uh, Unstoppable. And what we are looking at is the unstoppable move of God uh, that uh, began with um, uh, the, the beginning of the church and the start, launch of the church, the sending out of, of Jesus' followers and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that is what is recorded for us in this book, this book that we call The Acts of the Apostles. And it records for us the first few decades of the early church. And uh, if you've been with us, you know that already we've seen some, um, some important key things that we need to keep in mind throughout this series. Um, to illustrate that, you know, I was reminded of this week, kind of a flashback. I hadn't thought about this for many, many years, but I heard a pastor talking about um, this thing from um, kind of Sunday school. If you grew up in church, maybe going to Sunday school, you may have been taught this, um, and it's not theologically correct, okay? Um, so here's, here's what I want to do. I want to just kind of correct some maybe errant theology that you've been taught, Some of you remember this, okay? Uh, Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors, and you see all the people. Or somebody said that you kind of flip it over. See, I was always kind of weirded out as a kid because the people are your fingers, and I'm like, why are they hanging from the ceiling? Like, what's going on with that? right? Um, but this was, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, see all the people, all right? So uh, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Well, Here's the thing, we said, we said before that the church is not a building. This is not the church, okay? The church is right here. It's what's inside. It's the people. The people are the church. And that's what we're already seeing and we're going to be reminded of throughout the book of Acts is that we are the church. The church is a movement of God's people set on mission together, empowered by the Spirit. That is what the church is. And so the church is going somewhere. The church is doing something and the church is made up of people. It is not a place It is not a facility, it is not an organization, it's not temporal, this is something that God established and he is doing through and with, it is people, okay? And so I try and correct all the time, I always try and say the church building, and I always try and add that. If you ever catch me, free license, you can call me out, be like, hey, I thought it was a church building, right? This is not the church, we are the church, all right? And so let's help each other with that. But we're going to see that here. We're going to see God's people. But here's what happens today. It is not um, overstating it to say that what happens in the chapter that we are beginning today is one of the most powerful chapters in all of Scripture, certainly in the book of Acts, because we are going to see the Holy Spirit descend upon God's people, the church. In Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at just the first part of it today, and we're going to take the next few weeks and walk our way through it. Um, but we're calling it the Holy Spirit comes. Simply that, the Holy Spirit comes, because we are going to see the Holy Spirit come upon the church. And if there's one idea that we're going to kind of see illustrated throughout the passage this morning, it's this, is that everything changed when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. Everything changed. There had been so many things leading up to this point in time. So many things were different from that. We ourselves are recipients of God's miraculous work through the Holy Spirit coming even here today. I mean, we are here on a different continent, speaking a different language, two millennium apart from what happened here, and yet we are recipients of this message, of this power, of this work, of this movement. This is the same movement that we are a part of that was propelled and, and you know, it, I, hate, I hesitate to say started because it, it, the church certainly started in a new way there, but this was a move of God that had been going on for uh, centuries, right? He had been working and building and kind of preparing his people, but here he, he, lits, he lights them on fire and sets them off and gets them going, and this is all what happens here at the day of Pentecost. So I'm so excited. We got tons to cover this morning. Hopefully you have a pen because um, we're going to, there's a lot that you're going to want to record and kind of look at this morning, but let's jump into it. We're going to see um, uh, this uh, amazing uh, move of God uh, here on this day of Pentecost. Let's read the text together, and then we're going to walk our way uh, through it. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says this, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these 
who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygria, Pamphylia, uh, Egypt and parts of uh, Libya, uh, along with uh, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, and we hear all of them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. This is God's word for us this morning, and we want to walk our way through it. And we're going to see uh, three things this morning that changed and what brought about the change. The first thing that we want to see, you can just jot this down, is we see that there was a plan for Pentecost. There was a plan for Pentecost. And I just want to start uh, with, with... Verse 1, because this really sort of sets the table, so to speak, for us to understand what is happening in this powerful passage. Um, in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. All right, so we have um, some specifics around when and where and how this all happened. It happened on the day of Pentecost. Now, here's the thing. Um, we got to understand a couple things because this is sort of foreign to us. We don't necessarily know exactly what Pentecost was. Uh, maybe some of you uh, do. But even me, in my, my study this week, I, I thought I kind of knew some things going in. I was blown away at how much is in this idea around Pentecost. So I just want to share some of that with you this morning, and I, I trust that you're going to be blessed through it. But there was a plan for Pentecost. Pentecost, the word, it means 50 all right? It stood for and kind of was the name of this festival, which was also known, and you'll find it in Leviticus, as the Feast of Weeks. And what the Feast of Weeks was is it was a celebration of God's provision to his people through harvest. And it was the culmination, part of a seven-week period of harvesting that actually began at Passover on the day of first fruits, just after Passover, the priest would do this wave offering with sheaves of barley, okay? So they would harvest some barley, and the priest would do this sort of wave offering as a, as a symbol of, of, of uh, uh, praising the Lord for this harvest that was coming. But then for the next seven weeks, they would harvest, and they would um, uh, praise the Lord through that, and culminating into this feast, the Feast of Weeks, known as Pentecost, seven Sabbaths later, so if you do the math, seven Sabbaths, that's seven weeks, 49 plus a day, all right? So it was seven Sabbaths plus a day, 50 days later, they would sacrifice. And the families would bring, they would bring two baked loaves made from freshly gathered wheat. And this was part of the Pentecost uh, celebration. Now here's the thing that's so important about this. There's so many things that is tied to this that we're gonna see fulfillment of Pentecost in the coming of the Spirit, and it's incredible. But there's a direct link between Pentecost and Passover. Now, here's the thing. Even as I say Passover, there's probably many of you um, who know maybe something about Passover, uh, have been connected with Passover. But Passover leads to Pentecost, and the two are tied together. And that was one thing I just don't know that I ever saw or recognized before. But Passover leads to Pentecost. The two are inseparably linked. So if we're going to understand Pentecost i got to actually back up just a little bit. we got to understand some things about Passover, okay? Passover, um, maybe this is familiar to you, but this is so good. Uh, Passover, the first Passover, happened in Egypt. The nation of Israel was in captivity to the Egyptian pharaoh, and God was, was leading his people out of captivity. And so he did a series of miracles culminating to this, this um, coming of uh, the Spirit of God, uh, and, and he took from the homes the firstborn son, of every home that did not have blood over its doorpost. See, he came to his people and he said, listen, this is how I'm going to protect you. This is how I'm going to save you. I want you to take, sacrifice a lamb, and I want you to take the blood of this lamb and, and spread it over your doorpost. Then when the Spirit comes, he's going to pass over and you will be saved through the giving of this blood. The blood will protect you. And so that was the first Passover. And so from that, the people of God continued every year to have a special dinner 
a special meal and, and celebrate Passover. They would give of a lamb. The families would, on the eve of Passover, would have a, a meal uh, together. And there was so much symbolism and remembrance of God's faithfulness and protection for his people. And that's really what Passover came to be celebrated as. It was God's protection for his people. Protection through this lamb and the blood of the lamb that did it. And so they were remembered each and every year as instructed by God. But here's the thing. Here's how Pentecost is connected with Passover. You see, Pentecost was not celebrating so much God's protection as it was his provision. And that's what's so amazing about the connection. You see, God led his people out of captivity, but he didn't just lead them out and leave them alone. He led them out and then he provided for them. And so the, the celebration of Pentecost is a celebration of harvest and provision and God's working. Through the centuries, it also became the time when they would celebrate and remember God's giving his provision of his law. You see, if you go back and kind of look at the timeline, it was actually after Passover that God led the people to Mount Sinai, and it was believed that that, that was actually at Pentecost is when he gave his law there at Mount Sinai. So not only were they celebrating God's provision through the harvest, but they were also celebrating his provision through his law and through establishing that Mosaic covenant with his people. And so they had God's provision for them. And so all of this we're going to see linked to and tied to what is happening here. Okay, so here's where things get really good. So now that we understand kind of what Passover was, what Pentecost was, how does that bring us to this passage here? Well, first off, we have to understand that Passover was fulfilled in the coming of Christ. There are so many things. We don't even have time to unpack all of them. But there was a special meal that was known as the Passover Seder, and that is packed full of meaning and, 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 and pictures, symbols that, that you look at, and you're like, that's Christ. That's, that's, that's fulfilled in Jesus. That's, that's what that was. We actually, together as a church, we're going to do a Passover Seder together um, pre-pandemic. We had plans in place, and we were kind of working toward that, and then everything kind of shut down, and we couldn't do it. And so we were really hoping to do a Passover Seder. So uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to this, uh, this spring. We'd love to do that because it's such a great learning, um, instructing time to uh, walk through a, a Seder uh, together and see all these pictures foreshadowing, looking forward to the Messiah, which we see fulfilled in Christ but the, just a couple things with Passover. This is one thing um, that I had, don't know if I had seen before, but you know that the family, what they would do is they would acquire the lamb five days before it was sacrificed. The reason for that is they would look at it and watch to see if there was any defects within it. For five days, they would monitor it, watch it, look for defects. Do you know that it was five days before Jesus was handed over to the priests to be sacrificed that he came into Israel on a donkey? And for five days, we have record of him being tested and tried and scrutinized by the religious leaders, officials, testing him. And it all culminates to Pilate saying, there is no fault that I can find in this man. He was found to be without defect. He was perfect. They watched the lamb and they would give it over. On the eve of Passover, the families would bring the lamb to be sacrificed and it was given over to the priests at the third hour, and then at the ninth hour, it was sacrificed. So much symbolism in this, looking forward to the time of Christ. Do you know that Mark carefully records for us that it was when Jesus was hung on the cross, he was hung on the cross at what time? The third hour. The very hour that those lambs were being given over to slaughter, Jesus was being hung upon the cross. And the ninth hour in which those lambs were being slaughtered is what it says and records for us in the Gospels at the ninth hour is when he died and he gave up his life. And there, all the symbolism, centuries of symbolism had been building and waiting and pointing to the fulfillment of the perfect lamb given for the sacrifice of sins that there would be no need for animal sacrifice anymore because it is all filled in the person of Jesus Christ, the perfect, spotless, sinless lamb of God. Amen. This is what... The people had been waiting for it and looking for it. But here, it gets even better. Do you know that on the third day, when Jesus rose from the grave, that wasn't just any day. That was the day of first fruits. Remember that day that that wave offering happened of the barley? That was the day which Jesus came to life Again, the first fruits given from God. In 1 Corinthians, it's recorded. It refers to Jesus as the first fruits given from God. 
And so here we have Jesus rising from the grave, and it's his first fruits. But what do we say? We say that Passover by itself, all by itself, is not much. If he just, if he just, um, uh, if he just uh, pr- uh, protects but doesn't provide, then, then there's no good in that. But what, what we see is that he protects his people through the giving of his son, but then he provides at Pentecost. And so it's all building up to this. So at Pentecost... We see this. This is when the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out. This is when God provided his spirit for the church. And it was on this day when the people of God celebrated the anniversary of the law of Moses, Torah, being given to them that the spirit was now given to God's people. Do you see how in the same way that Jesus fulfilled Passover, the Holy Spirit given at Pentecost fulfills Pentecost? After Jesus came, there was no need for Passover to ever happen again. Why? Because the sinless, spotless Lamb of God had now been sacrificed. Similarly, there is no need for Pentecost after the Holy Spirit was given. Why? Because God's ultimate provision of his Holy Spirit upon his people was now given and poured out in a miraculous way. It was all fulfilled. It was all leading to this. One commentator said it this way. God's people had been Torah-centered, Torah-directed. Torah is a fancy word for law, right? Law-centered, law-directed. Now they were Christ-centered and spirit-directed. Everything changed at the giving of God's spirit at Pentecost. In the same way that the Last Supper was the last Passover because it was all fulfilled in Christ, this is the last Pentecost because it was all fulfilled in the giving of the spirit. Amazing. Amazing. And here, I think at this point, we just have to stand back from all of this and just say, how great is our God, right? Who could orchestrate all of this? Who could do this except for God? Only God could do such a thing. Like, how do you line up all of these things so that Jesus is arriving in Jerusalem just at the time of Passover, and he's being handed over to the priest, and he's being sacrificed at the same time that the Passover lambs are being slaughtered, and there he is uh, rising from the grave on the day of first fruits, and then 50 days later, 50 days later, after a period of him teaching, ascending to heaven, going and leaving his followers, 10 days after that, on the 50th day, the Spirit comes. He is working in all of it. He had it all planned. And so for centuries, he was leading and pointing God's people, culminating to this moment right here. It's incredible. It's incredible. This was the plan for Pentecost all along. And so I think what we need to do is we do, we need to step back from it and we just need to look and wonder and awe at our God. And here's the truth for us today is that we, I think all of us, if we're honest, we long for something of transcendence. We long for something beyond ourselves, something bigger than us, something more powerful than us, purpose that's beyond just what you and I can kind of conjure up. And let me just tell you, it is found in the one true only living God, the God of the Bible. It's the God who is three in one, Father, Son, Spirit, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of creation, the God who is over all things, all other gods, any power, principality, you or I, he is over it all. This is the transcendence that our heart longs for. And when we see moments like this, when we see the way that God is working in all of it, we can worship. It should lead us to worship. And what a reminder for us. As we live through a season, a time, when we're like, God, what are you doing right now, right? What's happening on our planet, in our world, in our country? And I would just say this, is that not for a moment, not for a moment is God on cruise control and just letting things slide. He is working in all of it. He is present in all of it. He had a plan in all of this, culminating to this point. He is just as much present, working, leading in this moment that we are living through even now. He's here. And so we're seeking after, looking after, longing for God's transcendent work upon our lives. That's verse one. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Who's they? Well, we saw um, just in chapter one, there was 120, about a little more than gathered in that place. We don't know exactly what the place is. We're assuming it's that kind of upper room or the home or wherever they were gathered, but they were all there together the day of Pentecost. The plan is in place. Here's what happens next. We're going to see power at Pentecost. There's power. Here's where the power comes. Verse 2. And suddenly, suddenly there was from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting 
And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right. So here's what we see. This is the day that they've been waiting for, right? Jesus, when he was with them, he says, hey, stay in Jerusalem. Do not depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. He says, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The Holy Spirit's going to come, and here is where the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the church. This is it. And there are what we have here, three visible signs of the coming of the Holy Spirit. He wanted to make sure that we don't miss it. You know, if I'm honest, my kids all the time, like, Dad, did you hear me? Are you listening? Right? They want to know that I heard my wife more often than I'd like to admit. Hey, did you hear me? Are you, are you with me right now? Right? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. I, 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 I lied. Um, and, and, and so he wanted to make sure that this was not a miss, that they had it. So he gave three visible signs of it. Here's the first sign. It's the wind. It's the wind. It says again in verse uh, 2, suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. So not necessarily a wind blowing through the place, but a sound of a wind. Where did it come from? Well, it came from heaven. It came down. They're like, this is otherworldly. This is, where is this coming from? This is coming down upon us. And it says a mighty rushing wind. And what did it do? It filled the entire house where they were sitting. And I think our language that we read it here tones it down a little bit. It would have been the sound like a rushing wind. Think tornado, sort of hurricane level. If any of you have been through a tornado or a hurricane or been in some sort of crazy storm and you hear the wind blowing, it's terrifying. Imagine that sound amplified now in your home, rushing through, going through. Some of us were freaked out a minute ago when our sound, I don't know what that was, when it just kind of like popped um, remember when you kind of like jumped for a second? Imagine that, except constant, like just sound rushing through. It was unmistakable. They heard it. They felt it. It filled the entire house where they were. What's the significance of the wind? Well, in the Hebrew Old Testament, the word that was used for the Spirit of God was ruha. You know what that means? It means wind, wind. So many times the Spirit is linked to wind, breath, this movement. I think the clearest place that we have is Ezekiel 37, 9 through 14. I don't have it on the screen, but you can hear it as I read from this. You can write down the reference if you want to check it out later. Ezekiel verse 30, or chapter 37, beginning in verse 9, it says, that he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain that they may live. So what did Ezekiel do? He prophesied. He prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, these dry bones, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. This was a picture of God's people, dead and dying and and lifeless. And he's like, prophesy, and this breath came, the wind came, and brought them to life. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you up from your graves, O my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and then you shall know that I am the Lord, and I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord." Surely, as the wind was coming, this was a very clear sign that the Spirit of God is present. The sound of the wind indicated that the Spirit was there and he was working. But that wasn't the only sign. Again, don't miss this. He wanted to make sure that they saw and understood that the Spirit was present. So what happens is also fire. They see fire, or it looked like fire, right? Verse 3, what does it say? And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. I remember as a kid kind of freaked out about this. I'm like, so they started on fire? It's like, no, that's not what it says. What does it say? It says divided tongues as of fire. So it looked like fire, but it wasn't consuming. It wasn't burning. But this appearance of fire was resting on each and every one of them, all 120 of them. These flames dancing around on their head looked as if it was fire. Why is this so important? Well, throughout Scripture, we see many times that God's presence, and when I talk about his presence, we're talking his manifest glory. 
His personal presence being illustrated, shown, given to the people, is given to us, shown as us, as a picture of fire. Do you remember how Moses was met in the wilderness in that burning bush? It was consumed by fire, but it was not burning up. And so that fire was present there. You see, as the people were there at Mount Sinai and God's presence was there, it was a consuming fire on Mount Sinai. There was a pillar of fire which guided Israel through the wilderness, and it was fire which hovered over the wilderness tabernacle. God's presence was illustrated throughout Scripture using fire. So here they are with little fires above their head. And they were called the words that John had said, John the Baptist. He said that he would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In Luke 3.16, Luke records the words of John the Baptist, which said, I will baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am unworthy to tie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So all these like alarm bells going off, they're like, fire, he said this would happen. He's baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire here in this moment. Now, here's what's incredible about this, is that every example I gave you was one kind of instance of fire kind of given to the people corporately. In fact, under the old covenant, the divine presence of God rested on Israel as a corporate entity and upon many leaders for special purposes. But here, we see this new covenant Right? This new age of the church being ushered in and under this new covenant established by Jesus, inaugurated by the Spirit at Pentecost, the Spirit now rests upon each believer individually. It's amazing. So it wasn't just the apostles that had this tongue as of fire above them. It was all 120 plus that were there. The men, the women, all of them were given this fire as if to show that his indwelling, his purpose was upon them. His power was being given to them. It was a visible representation of the presence of the Spirit of God there. If that wasn't enough, there was a third sign that accompanied the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was this, this languages. Look at verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Um, the word that we have in the ESV there is tongues. I think a great translation for that is languages. Why? Well, in verse 5, it kind of explains it to us. It says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under language. And at this sound, I'm guessing the sound of that wind, right? It was pretty terrifying. So they all came running. What's that sound? At the sound of this wind, uh, the multitude came together and they were bewildered. Why? Because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language, all right? So there are these known languages of people all over, all over that were now being spoken and they were hearing it. So it wasn't a gift of hearing and interpretation that was being given. It was a gift of speaking, like they were actually speaking it. And the wild thing about it, just to kind of jump ahead a little bit, is these men shouldn't have known or there was no reason why they would have known these languages. Verse 7 said they were amazed and astonished and saying, are these not all who are speaking Galileans? Right? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? You see, they were speaking these languages so that it could be understood. What is so significant about this? Well, first off, I think it's important to point out, this wasn't just kind of, you know, we think of like maybe when we think of tongues in church or the spirit, it's like kind of Pentecostalism or kind of this angelic language or sort of uh, a language that needs interpretation or something like that. And maybe you've heard or studied kind of that. That wasn't this. This was, again, known languages being preached. And what were they saying? They were giving witness, giving testimony to who God was. And I think what this is for us is a clear picture of of a direct reversal of the curse that was given at the Tower of Babel. How amazing is that? Do you know what happened at Babel? Babel, you got to go all the way back, I think it's Genesis 11 to see that. But at Babel is where, um, is where the, the uh, people gathered together. And um, God had said to the, to the people, he says, go, be fruitful, multiply, fill the land. The people kind of saw their greatness in their own eyes. They wanted to gather together as one people and establish their own name. And so they were building this tower. And so God, to kind of thwart that effort, he came down and he, it says, confused their languages. 
And so imagine the confusion. Like I'd love to like kind of be a fly on the wall and see that. They're all kind of working and they're like, hey, hand me that two by four. Or, hey, can I get that hammer? And all of a sudden they don't understand each other. They're like, what did you just say? You know, and then they're like mad because like, they don't understand him. And so I'm sure there was some yelling ensued and, and all of that. Well, he confused all of their languages. I imagine God kept families together, right? Imagine the relief when you get home and you're like rush in and you start talking to your wife or kids and you're like, and they understand you. Oh, wow, okay. So what they found, they kind of grouped up, they moved out, and they, uh, now all of a sudden nations, cultures, uh, were sort of born from that. Why? Well, they didn't really have any other option. They couldn't understand each other. God confused their language. It was a curse. It was a curse for their unwillingness to go and to, and to spread out, rather to remain together and to prove their own name. What do we have here is a direct reversal of that curse. What is God doing? He's gathering the nations together again. And instead of one language and kind of one culture, he's bringing all of the languages and all of the cultures together, together under the name of Jesus Christ. Think about this. How amazing is this? The first time, this was the gospel being preached. The first time the gospel was being preached, it was being preached in every language that was known at the time. How amazing is that? I mean, the word was going forth. All these known languages represented it says that. It says devout men from every nation under heaven were there in that place. And they were each hearing the word spoken, the gospel spoken in his own language. See, this is amazing. When the Holy Spirit comes, this is the power of God coming upon the church. Our clearest understanding of this is when we see the parallel with the baptism of Jesus. You see, Luke's already kind of primed the pump for us, but if you look back at chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, You heard from me, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So get the connection here. In the same way that Jesus, beginning his earthly ministry, was baptized and the Spirit came upon him and he was now empowered for ministry, in the same way now the church gathered together the Holy Spirit came upon them and empowered the church for the work of ministry. It's the parallel that Luke is drawing for us right here in his recorded writings. And so what we see is we see this baptism take, take place. It's the first time that the Holy Spirit is given to individuals in this way. It's never been done like this before. The Spirit has now been given to the church. And it's been given to those faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And here is what we see, and we're going to unpack this in the weeks to come, but we believe this, that this was a special coming of the Spirit. And we believe today that, that every believer also receives this same baptism of the Spirit. At City on a Hill, we hold to, we see this in Scripture, one baptism, many fillings. One baptism, many fillings. And so at the moment of salvation, when you pass from death to life, when Jesus redeems and restores you, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus as that perfect, perfect, spotless Lamb of God sacrifice for your sin, you are ushered into his family and you are indwelled with the Spirit. That is when you are baptized with the Spirit. But we see that there are many fillings that happens, right? We see it throughout Scripture, right? It says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled, be filled with the Spirit. So the question, I've heard it said this way, I think it's so good, is not so much, do I have all of the Spirit? If you are a follower of Jesus, you do. But the question is, does the Spirit have all of you? That's what a filling is, is when you are given over to the Spirit, when the Spirit has you. Adrian Rogers said it this way, I think this is really good, being baptized with the Spirit means that He is now resident within your heart. Being filled with the Spirit means that he is now president within your heart. Isn't that good? Right? So, so we're, we're, he takes up residence. When you enter into a relationship with Jesus, that he is now resident within your heart, but, but being filled with him means that he is now president within your heart. So we see this baptism and this filling happening at once. He was now presiding over their hearts and then taking over, and he was now speaking through them so that the languages of the people, the gospel could go forth, and it could be heard in that. And so here's what we're after today. Here's what we're going after. Because I think sometimes we read this and we're like, is this what we need to re replicate? Do we have to like, go back there and, and kind of relive that again? A.W. Tozer says it this way. He says, we're not going after a repetition of Pentecost, but rather a perpetuation of Pentecost. You see, 
The same power that was given to the church there is the same power that is still at work today. So we're not gonna experience the same wind and fire and and these kind of known languages being proclaimed and preached. But what we are gonna experience is that same Holy Spirit power given to the church today. So even as we gather this week, Tuesday night, do you guys know about the prayer meeting that we're having Tuesday night? As we gather Tuesday night, We are with dependency and expectancy, trusting that the same power that came upon the church then will come in there. Are we expecting that the place is gonna like, (laughs) that the wind is gonna kind of come and fill this place, that there's gonna be fire? No way. If any of those things happen, we've got a problem. We gotta call 911, or we gotta call a plumber or something, right? Like, that's gonna be an issue if we're hearing sounds or seeing fire, okay? So we're not looking after that, but what we are looking for is we're looking for the power of the Holy Spirit to be present and working in this place in the lives of believers. This is what he is doing. Here's the encouraging truth of this, and we gotta make sure we don't miss this, is this is the power that is at work within you. This is the power that is given to every believer. Remember, the tongues as of fire came upon them all, all 120. And so as inadequate or as ill-equipped or as feeble as you might feel at times, I promise you this, God has equipped you with his Holy Spirit power to do the work that he's called you to do. If you are a follower of him, he has given you his power. His spirit has indwelled you, and he wants to fill you. He wants to take up not just residence, but he wants to become the president of your heart, of your life. We need to recognize this power, church. There are far many two times that we try and do things in our own strength and power. Can I just be honest for a second? Even as we were singing that song, um, This We Know, I had this flashback to that launch Sunday. And I remember sitting there on the front row singing that song over in Memorial High School, and so many things had gone wrong that day. And this whole work of God that he was doing here in this establishing this church felt so fragile, right? Like a strong like breath of, of air could blow the whole thing over. Um, I used to joke that, you know, in the early days when we were just doing kind of core group meetings, that I had this suitcase that I would kind of carry around to meetings. Like, before the church kind of began, like, if I would have got hit by a bus and that suitcase would have got lost, like, the church would have been, like, over. Like, there was just, there was no record of it ever, ever even happening, right? Like, I felt in, that, in those moments, like, there was so, it was so fragile and so frail. And I felt this utter dependency and this, this need for God to work and to move. And if I'm honest, church, there are times, there are days that I... Do not rest and trust in God's working and power here, but I look to and I rest on some of the things that he has been so good to us for. I look at the resources that we have. I look at the people that he's assembled, the skills that are represented in this room, and I say, yeah, we've got this, right? We can do this. We can do the thing that God's called us to. No, we can't. Apart from the work of God and his power at work in us, we cannot do it. And so would we be careful that we never get into that place that we're like, oh, I got this. I can do this. We need this power at work in it. And he gave it to the church. He gave it to the church for a reason. And that's where we get to the last, the last place we see things changing is the purpose of Pentecost. There was a reason why he gave his spirit. Let's get a running start at it. We already read these verses, but let's look at it again. Verse seven. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Let me just pause there for a second. The Galileans were sort of like the country folk, okay? So we all live in kind of the, um, you know, the great Midwest. We're up here kind of in the north. I didn't realize that I had an accent until I moved down to North Carolina. And then everyone told me I had an accent. I'm like, you don't have an accent. Y'all have an accent, right? And it was like, and it was, it was that whole thing. And so I kind of like learned to kind of tone down my, um, you know, bag and, and I didn't call it pop and all that stuff, right? They used to kind of make fun of me. They're like, you're such a Yankee. You do all these things. And I'm like, well, Yeah, whatever. And so we kind of get in this little thing. Well, this is kind of the same thing going on here. Galileans were not good. They kind of swallowed their syllables, and they couldn't pronounce the gutturals. And so there were certain dialects and languages and things that they just weren't going to come up with. And so here, they're hearing not just their language being spoken, but it's like without accent. Notice what it says. It says, how is it that we hear each of us in our own language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. Why does Luke list all of these places? His whole point is here. We, see, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. His reason for listing all these is to say, listen, it was the nations that were hearing. There were Jews that had 
then dispersed through the diaspora, right? The, the, the dispersion of the Jews. They had now come back. They were living there in Jerusalem. But in addition to this, this is the other wild thing about Pentecost. You want one more kind of cool thing about Pentecost? It was one of three traveling pilgrimage festivals for the Jewish people. This was the most attended of them all. It happened in June. The weather was perfect. And so people would travel from all over the place. The Jews would come together. And so it was here at this moment that the Spirit was given and that the nations were gathered there. So you have Jewish people with all these different languages and cultures represented, and it was there that the gospel was going out. And it says here, we were all amazed, they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? What were they hearing? They were hearing in their own tongues the mighty works of God. Now we know if you scan ahead, you're going to see it, and we're going to get to it in the coming weeks, but 3,000 people responded that day. 3,000. 3,000 put their faith and trust in the forgiveness and the work of Jesus on the cross. Peter stands up and he answers this question, what does it mean? He, he unpacks for them that the law had been given to show the need for a sinless Savior that the Messiah had to come and make a way and that Jesus was that Messiah, that he had given his life and that he had been buried in the grave and he had rose to, 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 to life and he was now there standing as the Messiah that they were all longing and looking for. And this is the same beckoning call that we have today is that we are invited to see the mighty works of God and to believe that Jesus is the Savior that we all need. This was the purpose of Pentecost. See, God sent his Holy Spirit upon his people so that the mighty works of God would be proclaimed. And I think it's just worth noting that when the mighty works of God are proclaimed, you can expect opposition. Listen, even in the midst of all of this, look what it says. It says, others were mocking them, saying they are filled with new wine. Like, man, these guys are drunk. What's going on? Peter's like, no, it's still the morning. We're not, not drunk. We just have the Holy Spirit, Right? Peter or Paul picks up on this. He says, right, do not be filled with wine or do not be drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's like they had taken over. They had given themselves over to the Spirit. The Spirit was at work in them and they are seeing it, but others mocking. They don't get it. They don't understand. But this is the point. It's to give testimony to and point to the glory of God. Listen, church, would this be said of us in all of our days? Would this be said of us in our homes? Would this be said of us in our lives? Would this be said of us in our family? Would this be said of City on a Hill at His Church? Would we, both corporately, individually, be that city on, set on a hill, as Matthew 5 says, that cannot be hidden, that our lights would shine before others, that they would see our good works, and in turn, they would give glory to our Father who is in heaven? Would they see and hear from us the mighty works of God? This is the purpose which with we have been filled with the Spirit. It's not just so that we can have contentment, that we can have some joy, that we can have some purpose. This is the purpose, is that we would be able to proclaim the mighty works of God around us. Would we give ourselves to this? This is something worth investing in. This is something that's going to uh, echo for eternity. This is something that we have been invited into through the mighty pouring out of God's Spirit and the work in our church. This is why we exist. For four years, we have been pointing to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hopefully, God gives us another 40 years beyond, right? That we are pointing to the glory and the good works of God. And this is what the Spirit has come upon us to do. And He is doing all of that. Let's pray and give God the thanks for that. God, we give you praise. We give you thanks for your mighty power. God, your work in our life. And it was you who have brought us to this place of belief. God, I believe it's you even now in this moment. There are probably some who are wrestling with doubt or a lack of trust in you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would come upon them and in a way that they may not even be expecting, God, that they would respond to your, your powerful work in their life. God, thank you for your mighty hand, God, your faithful provision, your pouring out of your spirit. At the time of harvest, God, we are recipients of that. And so, God, we just give you thanks and we say that you are great. God, you are good. And we pray that you would do a mighty work in us and through us, God, for your glory. 
Lord, I ask that you would continue to lead and direct us as a, your church. God, that our heart would be shared with your heart. God, the things that we are about are the things that you've called us to. God, that we don't go anywhere without you leading first. Spirit, we ask that you would continue to take up not just residence, but God, direction in our life. We ask this in the name of your son, the powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.